Economics. My name is Paolo Mauro, I'm a senior fellow here at the Institute, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Alejandro Werner. He's the director of the IMF's Western Hemisphere Department, and he will speak to us about the economic outlook for Latin America in challenging times. Dr. Werner has a distinguished career uh, spanning service in government, in international institutions, in academia, in the private sector. He's been the director of the IMF's uh, Western Hemisphere Department since 2013. Uh, but he did have an uh, earlier stint there as an economist professional several years ago. Prior to his current role, he held many important positions in his native Mexico. Uh, he was under Secretary of Finance and Public Credit and previously Director of Economic Studies at the Central Bank. And I think it's fair to say that he's part of a cohort of senior policymakers that dramatically improved the stability of macroeconomic policies and economic performance in Mexico. So we're thankful for that. And in academia, he's the author of several successful articles on emerging markets, on exchange rate economics. He was a professor at ITAM in Mexico, and he also taught at the Instituto de Empresa in Madrid. Uh, in the private sector, he was head of corporate and investment banking at BBVA Bancomer. So he has a very broad ranging professional experience, which gives him a unique perspective and makes him perfectly qualified to present the outlook for Latin America. Today's presentation follows previous events here at the Peterson Institute on the outlook for the world economy and for various important economic regions. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Peterson Institute hosted uh, Dr. Minzu, the Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, and he spoke about unlocking global growth this week, we have a bit of a Western Hemisphere theme. Uh, on Thursday, the Peterson Institute will host an event on next steps in US-Cuba economic relations, which will feature our colleagues Barbara Kochwar and Gary Huffbauer, as well as Augusto de la Torre from the World Bank. Let me now give the floor to Dr. Werner. The title of today's presentation, Falling on Hard Times, is not exactly cheerful, but it is uh, refreshingly clear in giving us a glimpse of the tone of the outlook. So Alejandro, welcome. And despite the gloomy forecasts, we very much look forward to your analysis and insight. Thanks, uh, Paulo, for, for that introduction. And thanks uh, to the Peter Peterson Institute for hosting us here. Uh, as Paolo said, I mean, we're presenting our forecast for, for the region after we updated our projections uh, like 10 days ago from, uh, from the World Economic Outlook. And what we decided to do is to go relatively quickly over our updated projections and then turn towards three topics that uh, we thought were important uh, for the region. The first one is the impact uh, that the price of oil is going to have uh, regionally. Secondly, I, I would like to touch upon a medium-term growth for the region and the, the investment and savings nexus in, in Latin America and how that is coming back to haunt the region in terms of affecting potential GDP going forward. And close by reviewing the recent data on corporate indebtedness and corporate, I mean, corporate leverage in Latin America that has been an area in which uh, we have hi highlighted uh, in our uh, GFSRs that vulnerabilities uh, might be uh, being generated in emerging markets. So we wanted to take a look at how we are seeing those vulnerabilities in the region and what are the main uh, data that we will need to follow going forward in our surveillance uh, exercises. I mean, looking at how we updated our uh, forecast for the world economy, as uh, it has already been discussed here, we're expecting 2015 to show a slightly uh, higher rate of growth than 2014, but we revised down from our uh, October projections. Basically, uh, the advanced economy is doing slightly better, and that explained by, by the US, but having revised Europe and, and Japan uh, downwards, 
and the emerging markets having a, had a generalized a downward revision from our October projections to the current projections for 2015 growth. And if you look at the size of those uh, revisions, basically, I mean, we have had very important revisions both uh, for the BRICS and for Latin America as a, as a whole. Uh, so turning towards Latin America, and if you look at a, I mean, ten, three decades uh, uh, perspective, you can see, I mean, our medium term outlook would be for Latin America to go back to the pre-boom rates of growth that Latin America exhibited in the, in the 90s or early 2000s. I mean, after that, I mean, mainly driven by the commodity boom and also driven by uh, the stabilization that took place in many Latin American economies. We saw an important increase in uh, income per capita that generated several years of a uh, higher growth than uh, what we now think is uh, its potential. And obviously that was significantly helped by the very important increase in national income that Latin America experienced due to the increase in commodity prices. I mean, in some research that was undertaken in, in the department uh, like 18 months ago, I mean, a, a couple of economists uh, measured the windfall income effect that commodity prices represented for the region. And basically what we saw is that on average for those countries that did had a commodity, a terms of trade boom, the net present value of the additional income generated by the exports of commodities was of around, if I remember correctly, 90% of one year GDP. Obviously this took place around in, in a 10 year period but it represented almost one time GDP in 10 years. Obviously, this, this effect is much more pronounced in Venezuela, in which the number was 300%. But if you go to Argentina, it's around 100%, et cetera, et cetera. So these countries went through a huge uh, income windfall episode, similar in some cases to the ones that we saw in the Middle Eastern uh, oil exporting countries. And, and, and that explains, obviously, an important part of the boom that we saw uh, from 2003 to 2013. If you split the sample of Latin American countries between those that had a commodity boom and those that didn't have a commodity boom, only the countries that did have a commodity boom experienced an increase in growth in the last decade, and those that, that didn't, I mean, actually maintain the, rate of, the rates of growth. And the most uh, important example in that second subsample is basically Mexico, in which the rate of growth in the last 10 or 13 years is basically around 2%. Uh, so what we are forecasting, or basically what our teams are forecasting for the next uh, six years is an average rate of growth of 2.5, coming down from 4.2 from the period of 2004 to 2012, and similar to the rate that uh, the region experienced between 1990 and 2003. And, and again, this reflects eventually where the revisions are coming from, are coming from South America. Uh, the rest of the sub-regions in, uh, in, in my department, I mean, are basically flat. But when, you, when we look at South America, almost all of the South American countries are experiencing a significant slowdown when we look at the change in growth between uh, the average between 2003 to 2011 with the average growth that we have seen in the last, uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, I mean, just going quickly uh, to our forecast for 2015 and maybe touching a little bit on 2016, I mean, we have revised significantly down, obviously, the, the, the growth outlook for Venezuela. I mean, we had already a, a relatively a sufficiently negative uh, outlook for Venezuela, but with the decline of, of, in the price of oil, I mean, uh, and without access to international capital markets, I mean, the significant adjustment that this will imply, we think is going to drive uh, towards a contraction of around 7% uh, this year. I mean, uh, Ven Venezuelan exports as a percentage of GDP hover around 30%. So with a decline of 50% in the price of oil, you can just do the, I mean, the econometrics 
to assume what would be the significant contraction that consumption should actually uh, take. And in an economy that was already being subject to significant shortages, to a significant underutilization of capital, uh, of their capital stock, and an economy that was basically being subject to a, a wide array of distortions. On top of that, you put a 10% of GDP shock to their, uh, to their income, and the lack of access to international capital markets does not allow this economy to smooth uh, this shock, and therefore we're expecting an increase in inflation from, 60, from around 60% to 90% in 2015, and a contraction of 7% in, on, in their economy. I mean, the other two economies uh, that have had very important revisions there are Peru and Brazil, and that's basically because their numbers for 2014 were much weaker than what we expected in, in, in October. And then we had, I mean, uh, milder revisions for the rest of the countries in, uh, in the region. I would like to highlight that, I mean, the, the two sub-regions that are doing, or we expect them to do better than what we expected six months ago or four months ago are basically Central America and the Caribbean, two regions that will, be, that will benefit the most from the decline in the price of oil and from the larger growth that we are expecting in the U.S. The same must be true, especially with the U.S. Uh, in the case of Mexico, but in the case of Mexico, we are, I mean, we saw a second half of 2014 that was weaker than what we expected, and that effect more than offsets the positive effects of the uh, upward revision in U.S. growth uh, or the impact that that can have in, in 2015, and that's why we revised slightly downwards GDP growth for Mexico for, uh, for 2015, but we still think that it's an economy that's going to benefit from the recovery in the U.S., and also, as we will see a little bit further along the presentation, uh, the effect of the price of oil in Mexico is no longer as important as it used to be uh, 20, 20 years ago. I mean, looking at uh, what were, which were the main drivers of the deceleration in South America in the last five years, I mean, you see investment really decelerating extremely fast and also exports. This is the real value of exports if you look at the dollar value of exports, the deceleration has been much, much faster, and even now it's growing at negative rates when you impute the fall in the price of commodities. So from the aggregate demand side, these are the components that have been driving the deceleration. Consum private consumption has been holding up relatively better than exports and, uh, and investment, and obviously the external drivers explaining this um, this evolution are the first leg of the commodity adjustment taking place between 2011 and 2004, and I mean the beginning of 2014, where the price of metals and the price of agricultural goods to a much lesser extent had an adjustment. And then in the second half of 2014, the second leg of the commodity price adjustment basically hitting the oil exporting countries with a significant decline in the price of oil, and on the chart on the right, you can see the very high correlation between the terms of trade and investment in Latin America driving uh, exports and driving uh, the investment slowdown that we highlighted before. In terms of how this, uh, this has affected uh, exchange rates in, in Latin America in general, we see two, uh, I mean, two subsamples to explain the depreciation that we have seen in every major currency in Latin America. The first period going from, I mean, April 2013 up to the summer of, uh, of 2014 was driven by the deep, I mean, by the correlation of the declining commodity prices and uh, the depreciation of the commodity uh, oriented economies. And in the second half of, uh, of last year, a significant depreciation triggered by the appreciation of the, of the U.S. dollars in those economies that were slowing down and that have inflation targeting regimes come a well-functioning foreign exchange rate uh, market. We saw significant depreciations basically to compensate for the depreciation of the, of, of the U.S. dollar. I mean, turning towards the impact of the price of oil in the region, I mean, here we just highlight these 
two legs of the commodity price adjustment. I mean, uh, on the first phase, the commodity price adjustment being much more uh, oriented towards metals, uh, towards metals, and starting in the second half of last year, basically seeing uh, the price of oil adjustment impacting the region. When we look at net oil exports as a percentage of GDP for Latin America, we see, as I said before, I mean, the very high exposure that Venezuela has, followed by Ecuador, and after that, basically, sorry, Venezuela followed by Bolivia. In the case of Bolivia, our exports of natural gas, but given that all their gas contracts are tied to uh, oil benchmarks, they have been affected uh, to a very significant extent. After that, Colombia and Venezuela with a net, e net export exposure as a share of GDP of around 8 to 6 percent. And then the case, I mean, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, but uh, I will focus on Mexico in which basically, given the important decline in the production of oil that has taken place in Mexico in the last 10 years, and the significant increase in the imports of gasoline, when you look at net trade uh, of oil and oil derivatives in Mexico, is almost negligible. So from the point of view of the economy as a whole, I mean, the Mexican economy is almost not affected by uh, the decline of the price of oil. And then you see how, I mean, going to the, to, the, to the right of that chart, I mean, you go all the way towards Guyana with an, uh, a net import oil bill of 20% in GDP and many countries in the range between 5 and 10, 12% of GDP, highlighting the very positive oil shock that many medium-sized and small-sized economies in Latin America are going to experience in uh, 2015. When we look at the impact from the fiscal side, I mean, obviously, in, in the case of Venezuela, almost 60 percent of their government revenue comes from oil and basically from oil exports. Then you have Colombia, Ecuador, and Mexico basically with the same type of exposure in terms of their uh, budgets with respect to oil export dependency, and in Mexico, a much higher dependency when you look at the amount of revenues they are getting from uh, basically domestic sales, but that's a kind of exposure that they will have anyway, regardless of whether they are an exporting or an importer of uh, oil and oil derivatives. So uh, from the point of view of the fiscal accounts, we, we, we highlight obviously Venezuela ha having, I mean, this uh, very strong dependency on oil and then Mexico, Colombia, and Ecuador having a relative important dependency on oil on their uh, budgets of around 8 to, uh, to 10 to ten percent. On the other side, I mean, just highlighting what we saw in the previous, in the previous graph, in the Caribbean, the oil bill will be reduced by around uh, between 3 and 4 percentage points of GDP between 2013 and 2015. In, in Central America, this positive shock will be of a higher than two percentage points of GDP, and in the rest of the oil importing countries, it will be around one percentage point of GDP. So, I mean, this shock represented a very positive influence for many economies in Latin America. When you look, at, when we look at Latin America as a whole, is basically neutral for uh, for the region. For a, a very important subset of countries in Latin America, there's an, an offsetting negative effect from the positive effect from the decline of the price of oil that is the possibility that due to the financial problems that are occurring in Venezuela that Venezuela might cut back on the financing that they're given to a significant number of small economies when these economies buy their oil from Venezuela this I mean this has been basically called the Petrocaribe uh, mechanism through which uh, 60 percent at, at very high prices of oil, 60% of the sales of oil from Venezuela to these countries are financed at very concessional terms. And therefore, what we try to compare in this, in this graph is under the assumption that there is a sudden stop in this Petro-Caribe financing, how does that sudden stop compare to the savings that these economies will be getting from the reduction in the price of oil? For almost all of these economies, the savings that we'll be getting from the reduction in the price of oil more than offsets the decline or the possible sudden stop in Petrocaribe financing. So, in a sense, I mean, we have highlighted these risks for this economy for a long time. 
if these risks were to materialize now, these economies will be in a better position to handle this shock than what we have said in the past in a situation in which the price of oil was much higher. However, I mean, I think the key, the key issue to highlight here, and that's a, m maybe a little bit complicated slide, I mean, on the left, what we are saying is that the Petro-Caribe arrangement is actually structured in a way in which the concessional financing is reduced when the price of oil drops. So automatically, there's an adjustment embedded in this mechanism. However, the problem that might still be present for some of these countries is that the benefits of a lower oil price in almost all of these countries being reaped by the private sector through lower energy prices. And on the other hand, the, the decline in the benefits from concessional finances fall on the government's uh, balance sheet. And in that sense, we have a distributional problem in some countries that might need to be dealt with either through a, a reduction on energy subsidies, the introduction on some energy taxes, budget adjustments, or alternative finances in the cases of those countries that have access to the market or have access to alternative sources of, uh, of finances. In most cases, these alternative sources of financing will be slightly more expensive than the petro caribbean arrangement in which the interest rate is between, on the concessional leg, between zero and 2%. And when we look, I mean, at how and how fast the decline in the price of oil is being transferred to the consumer in Latin America, I mean, around 30% of the countries in Latin America had an, just a, a freely determined market price for, uh, for gasoline. And in those cases, we're seeing almost an, an automatic uh, effect. In the rest of the countries, we have either 30, an, almost another 30% of countries that manage their internal price of gasoline through some type of formula. And therefore, through time, they will be uh, being beneficiaries of the decline in the price of, of gasoline and the, price of, and the price of oil. And then we have around 40% of the countries in which the, the internal price of gasoline is determined in a discretionary way by the, the authorities. And in some of these countries, they have been smoothing the price of gasoline. So their citizens didn't, were not subject to the significant increase in the price of oil. But then the decline in the price of oil will be reflected either in a strengthening of the balance sheet of oil companies or in a strengthening of public finances uh, of governments that were subsidizing, uh, uh, I mean, gasoline in the past. The space for an important reduction of fuel subsidies in Latin America is it's not as big as in other regions of the world, but it's nonetheless very important. And obviously, uh, what we have here is only fuel subsidies. If you include electricity subsidies, then you will have an even larger uh, scope for significant reduction on energy subsidies, taking advantage of this environment for the price uh, for the price of oil, and we think that this is something that should be spreading through the region in the less, in the next uh, in the next months. Another important uh, factor, looking on how the decline of the price of oil is going to affect the region, is even for some countries that are today net importers of oil or are basically have a balanced trade in terms of, of oil, is their future prospects of developing significant oil projects. And there, I mean, Latin America, I mean, there we have Central and South America uh, being one of the regions with the highest energy potential. And therefore, especially in, in the cases of Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico, three countries that have gone in the case of Brazil, through an important expansion in terms of exploration and eventual uh, increases in production going forward in the pre-salt. In the case of Mexico, having gone through a very important opening of the oil sector. And in the case of Argentina, having significant uh, shale gas resources in Vaca Muerta. Obviously, this, uh, the development of these projects will be subject to either some delays, to either some uh, cuts, or at least a redesign in the terms they should be implemented given uh, the environment of low oil prices. So on those countries, I mean, the effect of, on growth 
and uh, especially of medium term growth will be uh, higher than the simple effects feeding through the consumer that will take place uh, immediately. And also, I mean, looking at how investment in oil might end up uh, behaving in the, next, uh, in the next few years, we've already seen a very important decline in investment from the main, uh, I mean, mining companies in the world. I mean, when we average the, the, uh, the capital expenditures from the main mining companies, we saw that the declines have started in 2013, and they have continued throughout, uh, throughout the years. Uh, we saw something similar on agriculture, and we started uh, in the second half of 2014 to see revisions to capital expenditures coming from energy uh, firms, and we're expecting those, obviously, to continue into 2015. Personally, I do think that, I mean, obviously, the information that we're getting from energy firms is very uh, scattered. They're just coming out with the, their new investment guidelines for 2015, and therefore, I mean, that orange bar at the end on the energy uh, sector might end up being revised down significantly in the next few uh, in the next few months, and therefore, the region will continue seeing significant pressures towards a, a deceleration of investment in the next. Uh, in, in, in the next few years. I mean, if, if we look at, uh, for example, the central bank, uh, I mean, the Bank of Canada, I think, has put out a forecast of a decline of 30% in investment in the energy sector. I mean, Canada is, I mean, one of the countries with the highest uh, uh, average cost per barrel in terms of their oil, so they will be the most uh, exposed in terms of how investment is going to be affected by the decline in, in the price. But, I mean, the numbers that we are seeing from oil companies, I mean, they tend to range between 7 and 15% in terms of the decline in expected investment for next year, the decline in employment from some service companies. So, I mean, we're expecting important uh, effects on the economy coming from investment in, in the commodity in the commodity sector, this already is being reflected in the markets. I mean, when we see how, I mean, the stock of Ecopetrol and Petrobras has been furring in the last uh, in the last six months, they have suffered significantly. I mean, in both cases, reflecting the decline in the price of oil and also reflecting local issues. In the case of Petrobras, obviously, these corporate governance issues that are that are taking place. In the case of Ecopetrol, also reflecting the geology in Colombia and basically a company that is heavily exposed to that geology in an environment in which is, uh, I mean, future production is highly uncertain. I mean, going into 10, 15 years and therefore affecting uh, uh, their, their, their expectations of future profitability for that uh, company. In the case of Petrobras also being a heavily uh, leveraged uh, company when you compare it with other uh, with other oil companies in the region. In the case of Mexico, I mean, we don't have that much information given that it's not a, public, uh, a publicly traded company, but it is a very highly indebted company with a, a very high leverage, a very inefficient uh, company with the expectation of significant increases in efficiency coming from uh, the recent uh, energy reform taking place in in Mexico, we have seen, obviously, important correlation between so the sovereign and uh, the state-owned uh, companies in the energy sector in Venezuela, Brazil, and, and Mexico. Obviously, causality goes both ways. I think on this chart, what it's, it's interesting to see is that the spread has widened, highlighting that there might be some contamination going from the state-owned company to the sovereign this time around. And I think it's also interesting to, to notice that the correlation increases going to the right. And also, I mean, the way we, we just put these companies reflect uh, the degree of, let's say, good corporate governance from better to worse. No? I mean, we have, I mean, within these three companies, Petrobras being a publicly traded company with much higher standards in, in terms of corporate governments, governance, Pemex being uh, uh, neither Pemex, neither PDVSA uh, being publicly traded, but, I mean, the linkage between the sovereign and 
the company being much closer in the case of PDVSA, where PDVSA actually implements quasi-fiscal activities, etc., and the transfers between the company and the government are much harder to understand than in the case of the other uh, of the other two companies. Uh, but I think that's also an, 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 an interesting fact. I mean, going quickly to growth and investment and savings, I would like to highlight that the revisions that the teams have done in terms of medium-term growth for the region, when we look at either uh, all the region or excluding Argentina and Venezuela, just because given that we don't have a dialogue with the authorities there, I mean, making medium-term projections is much harder than in the other cases. So, but in both cases, I mean, basically, we're reflecting a situation in which growth is going back to po the, the potential growth that we were estimated, estimated in 2004, 2005. We, then we have a hump that maybe, maybe shows a little bit the procyclicality that all of our econometric methodologies have implicit in the way we measure a potential GDP growth. And, and maybe also some structural factors that were implemented throughout the boom years that had actually hindered future growth in, in the region. But I think the, the important fact here is that we think, uh, I mean, the, the growth potential of the region is back around to three and a half percent and way below the four, four and a halves that the uh, growth that the region experienced in a, in these golden in these golden years, we have seen, as I highlighted before, the slowdown in investment coming from levels that were above uh, that were above trend, and obviously all that is happening in an environment in, way, in which investment in Latin America is, is extremely low. I mean, the the purple line basically shows the investment to GDP ratio in Latin America when we compare it with Asia. Uh, we are six to seven percentage points below that. And what we have seen is basically that the slight increase that we saw in investment to GDP ratios in the last seven years, a significant part of that is related also to the commodity boom being more present in countries such as Colombia, Peru, and, and Uruguay, and in the, commodity, in the commodity sectors. An important part of of the perennial problem of Latin America with low investment is associated with very low, with a very low savings rate. And the region was able to get away from that constraint in the last 10 years because the increase in national, in national income coming from the windfall from commodities allowed them to increase investment with the, and increase savings with the significant increase in income that took place due to commodities. Now that that is over, I mean, the, these economies are back to a situation in which either they develop a significant dependence on foreign savings through a widening of the current account deficit to finance a boost on investment and therefore generated the traditional vulnerabilities that have affected the region, or they go back to a situation in, the, in which they don't invest that much, they grow less, given also the low total factor productivity growth that the region has experienced uh, or that everybody has measured, let's say, for the last, uh, for the last three decades. So underlying this um, these low potential growth forecast is the traditional low investment, low savings, and low productivity growth in Latin America. And obviously, to, to change that, I mean, moving towards a structural agenda that addresses uh, the lack of productivity in the region is, the, is key. I mean, looking into infrastructure, education, et cetera, I mean, just highlighting all the, I mean, the World Bank indicators, competitive indicators for Latin America, especially on education, we see the region doing extremely bad across the board. And in infrastructure and the ease, the ease of doing business, we see some differences across countries, but overall, these are areas in which the region should be doing much better. Just closing and going very quickly with respect to corporate uh, leverage. I mean, we have seen leverage going up in, in Latin America in the last five years. I mean, if you look on the chart on the left, I mean, from 2009 to 2013, debt to equity has been increasing, although EBITDA to interest expenses has been relatively stable, obviously because, I mean, local firms have been taking advantage of the current situation in low in, in international capital markets to refinance at much lower interest rates. However, if we look at the evolution of these ratios in the last few quarters, uh, 
I mean, we have seen an important deterioration on the EBITDA to interest expense, reflecting an important decline in profitability in non-financial companies in, in the region. A lot of that decline in profitability has been coming from non-consumer good uh, firms, but we're expecting that given these economies are slowing down, eventually that will affect employment in this region and maybe real wages, I mean, this will be feeding into consumer good companies in the next uh, in, in the next few quarters. When you look into uh, profitability or the return on equity on the commodity sector in Latin America, I, I mean, the decline in the return on equity has been much uh, sharper and, and, and therefore, I mean, I mean, this is a sector where we think that we might be seeing some problems in the next uh, in the next few years. I mean, when you I mean, we, you have seen this chart for, for the emerging markets many times. The, incli the increase in foreign currency borrowing that has taken place in the last few years, a significant increase due to the significant uh, uh, search for yield that has taken place uh, in the markets. I mean, obviously concentrated more than in any other economy in Brazil and Mexico just because of their, of their sizes. At the beginning, obviously, this reflected a significant also improvement in the terms, both maturity and yield, in which these companies were having access to the market. In 2014, we saw some deteriorations in those, uh, in those dimensions. This might, be, might reflect either a decrease in the quality of the issuers or a slight increase in the cost to the same, uh, the same issues. We, we have seen both of, the, of, of those phenomena. Uh, however, I mean, I, I, I think I don't want to, to leave you with a sense that we think that this has been bad for the region. We think that the corporate sector in the region has really used this renewed access to international capital market to significantly reduce the cost of their, of their debt and that's the, the black line coming down on the chart on the, on the left, and they have taken advantage of this to significantly increase the maturity of their debt as well, as you can see on the red and blue line, basically showing the share of issuance that is taking place at 10-year uh, maturities, and therefore replacing a much shorter maturity and more expensive, expensive debt, and that obviously has been reflected in the amortizations that are coming due in the next few years. I mean, if you look at the levels of amortizations from the corporate sector coming due in 2015, 2016, 2017, between $10 billion and $35 billion, this is rel extremely low numbers for Latin America uh, as a whole. I mean, if you think that, I mean, the amount of international reserves in Brazil at 380 billion, in Mexico, 190 billion, uh, Colombia also, I mean, very high reserves, Peru as well. So uh, to the extent that uh, we are not seeing a bunch of, of amortization, we're seeing a significant decline in uh, the, the, um, uh, the interest paid by, by, these, uh, by these firms. The last thing that we wanted to check is foreign currency exposure increasing significantly by non-tradable goods producer companies issuing in dollars and maybe not hedging this, uh, this exposure. It's very hard to know exactly what is being hedged and what is not being hedged. We just divided the companies in those companies that are tradable and non-tradable. There is, I mean, an important amount of issuance coming from non-tradable goods producing or services companies. However, if you take the case of Mexico, I mean, an important part of that uh, gray part of the bar is basically companies that have a significant amount of their revenues coming from abroad. I mean, either uh, this might be cement, with Cemex having a significant part of their income coming from the U.S. and other parts of the world. It could be the telephone company having a significant amount of the, their income coming from the rest of Latin America and being relatively well-rated corporate. So when you look actually at the subset of low-rated companies and non-tradable goods, goods of services producing companies, the share of uh, issuance that has taken place is relatively low and not of a systemic nature. So, I mean, the conclusion that we take from, uh, I mean, from the surveillance that we have done is this is an element that uh, 
is not generating a sy systemic vulnerability for the region in an environment of low growth and depreciating exchange rates, we do not discount that we will not have some corporates in the region going into restructuring problems, et cetera, but still we don't think it's a systemic uh, problem for Latin America. So in closing, I mean, we do think exchange rate flexibility is helping the region to adjust uh, to this uh, negative scenario that is uh, evolving, especially for South America. We do think that for oil exposed economies, a fiscal adjustment should be implemented relatively fast. Some of these countries do have fiscal buffers and that, that they might allow them to do this adjustment uh, in a smoother way, but we do think that uh, announcements on how these adjustments are going to be implemented uh, with a me within a medium-term framework are very important. Uh, we think, as, as I said, that is the opportunity to phase out extremely costly energy subsidies. As I said before, I mean, we, although Latin American banks are in general relatively healthy, we need to continue monitoring the health and the leverage and FX exposure of the, of the corporates. And more than that, I think the most important thing for Latin America to recover higher rates of growth in the medium term. I think a significant structural agenda should be launched. I mean, we're seeing that in Mexico, we're seeing an important discussion taking place in Chile. Uh, we're seeing this discussion brewing in other countries in the region, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the region will need to invest much more. It will need to save more. It will need to significantly enhance its, its productivity. And, and for that, uh, for each country, the agenda of structural reforms is very different, but I think the whole region should be focusing on, on, on those topics. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, as always, this was a very uh, impressive analytical presentation, uh, very much in depth in particular on the impact of uh, the decline in oil prices and uh, how the corporates are doing. I think that that was really excellent. So just to get the conversation going, perhaps I can ask a couple of questions and then we'll turn over to the audience. Um, I was very... Uh, struck by the diversity of experiences. And in fact, uh, in some ways, I don't envy you and your team uh, in having to discuss such a diverse region, um, not just with respect to the impact of oil prices, but more generally. And um, you know, you, let's leave aside for a moment North America, Mexico, Central America. Let's leave aside the Caribbean. Let's just focus within South America um, there you see, uh, I would say, two countries, uh, Argentina and Venezuela, that are not exactly those where the fund has an uh, in-depth dialogue and policies are not exactly what you would hope for. Those are the two economies where growth is negative. Everywhere else, uh, with the possible exception of Brazil, things are pretty good. Uh, Brazil is somewhere in the middle. So please elaborate a little bit on the diversity of policies and the diversity of experiences in the region. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, if, if you look at the two countries that, uh, that, that you mentioned, and I would like to, to frame this response in an environment or, or, or the framework that we should be thinking of is how the commodity boom play through within these different groups of economies. And I think uh, when you look, I mean, more than anything else at Venezuela, and also in the case of Argentina, you see economies in which they had a significant windfall. On top of that, 
these were the two economies uh, that had the largest expansion of their public sectors, I think, in the region together with Ecuador. Uh, and that they also, as the, in, the windfall from their commodities started to stabilize first, even before they started declining. But when they started to stabilize, uh, the trend, the increasing trend of expenditures, of pushing aggregate demand, et cetera, eventually reached a limit. These countries started facing significant balance of payment pressures, and therefore they started restoring or actually strengthening import controls, FX controls, et cetera. Those distortions started affecting the productive capacity of these economies. And then, in the case of Venezuela, then you receive a negative shock of this size, and therefore you have, a, I mean, these striking numbers of a significant decline in, in, in GDP that we're expecting for, uh, for the years. Then you have policy frameworks that are extremely uncertain, uh, that have an, a very short horizon, and therefore uh, economic activity is significantly hampered in, in the case of Venezuela. In the case of Argentina, I mean, you can, you can think of that environment uh, in a much milder setting, aggravated by a, a negative shock that is the holdout, holdout situation and therefore the lack of access to international capital markets and the, therefore having to manage an extremely difficult negative environment uh, in a situation in which their policy framework is deficient and in which uh, their productive capacity has been really uh, affected by a high degree of policy uncertainty, uh, high inflation, and, but I think it's very hard to find analysts uh, nowadays that will be forecasting a, a disruption in Argentina in 2015. And that's very different from Venezuela. I think in the case of Venezuela, you, when you talk to people, I mean, the, uh, the disruptive scenario is one that is highly uh, discussed. And in the case of Argentina, it's another year of, very, of negative growth, uh, high inflation, and eventually, people are expecting a change of policies when the new administration comes in and uh, some stability. As you were saying, I mean, the rest of the region basically handling, especially in the case of uh, Peru, Chile, and now Colombia, uh, I mean, being subject to a negative terms of trade shock in a situation in which they were already operating maybe above potential and therefore now slowing down very fast, both because maybe a slowdown was already coming because they were already above potential. On top of that, you throw this negative, uh, this negative shock, but, but in an environment in which their inflation targeting plus their floating exchange rate plus a relatively healthy financial system will allow them to manage this, this cycle in a normal, in a normal way. Okay, so perhaps to sum up, you, you started with a very uh, uh, depressing title, Falling on Hard Times. Perhaps to sum up, it would be fair to say back to normal for most of the region with a few exceptions. But perhaps I can prompt you to uh, look a little bit beyond the next couple of years. You've started talking a little bit about medium-term prospects. Um, but let's think about, uh, obviously, with all the uncertainties around the baseline, but let's think about growth over the next decade in the region. Uh, we've done some work here in the Institute thinking about growth in emerging markets around the world. And it's clear that emerging markets will continue to be one of the driving forces of economic growth in, in the global economy. But that said, uh, there are some emerging economies that were growing exceptionally fast, India, China, and so on, where perhaps the forecasts are a little bit on the optimistic side. For Latin America, actually, perhaps because it hasn't grown that fast over the past decade, the forecasts don't seem completely out of whack. But be that as it may, uh, 
what are your hopes? Uh, what would be a good scenario for the region? That what, what could happen that would lead to a good scenario for, for the region as a whole? I mean, f I would say first that in the short term, you, you don't see authorities uh, minimizing the importance of the current slowdown. I think I, the, the tendency and the bias toward thinking that you can manage this shock as a transitory shock and that the recovery to higher rates of growth might be around the corner is a temptation that every policymaker has and that maybe in some cases with a liquidity, if liquidity in inter, international capital markets is abandoned, uh, they can maintain a trend of a expansion of aggregate demand that will allow them maybe to push grow a little bit more than what is warranted and build some vulnerabilities. Um, and we saw a little bit of that in the case of Brazil. I mean, as the economy slowed down, we saw a lot of policy lending for the last four years. Basically, there are development banks. As the private sector or the private banks were significantly decelerating, uh, their exposure in terms of lending, public banks just significantly increase their, their balance sheets. Uh, I think uh, countries have to avoid that, that temptation in, in, in the short run and basically assume that they're seeing a shock that has permanent and transitory components and they should adjust to the permanent component of the, of the shock. And secondly, I think is, I, I mean, move as fast as possible in generating a political dialogue to move ahead with the structural reforms. I mean, having this same discussion in, in Sao Paulo some months ago, I mean, I said, I mean, and me having been in government in Mexico, I mean, a lot of people used to say, well, Mexico is moving really fast in terms of implementing structural reforms given the change in the environment, and I said, well, in the case of Mexico, actually it took 10 or 15 years for these reforms to take place. Mexico has been the slowest growing large Latin American economy in the last decade. And I think energy reform, telecom reform, etc., were being discussed in Mexico for 10 years and they were just implemented now. So I think uh, it will be important for the region as a whole to really speed up the introduction of reforms of, on their educational systems on their health systems, on infrastructure, on uh, structural issues, on opening up to trade that really generate a boost to investment uh, so that these economies can significantly increase their potential rate of GDP growth. I mean, it, to me, it seems very hard to think that uh, in an environment of subdued price of commodities, uh, we can really accelerate growth if we don't accelerate investment and if we don't accelerate a total factor productivity growth. And I think for that you need education and, and, and an environment that is conducive for these reforms. And I think on the macro side, these countries have the right framework. I mean, we have seen currencies depreciate towards new equilibrium levels, et cetera, et cetera. But I think on the micro side, there's still too much to be done to generate this boost to investment. Thank you, excellent. So let's turn over to the audience and uh, uh, there will be a first question right there. Please identify yourself, thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Uri Dadush with the Carnegie Endowment. Alejandro, that was a terrific presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, the oil importers in the region, uh, particular ones, uh, Central America, Caribbean, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, even after you adjust for some of the Petro-Caribe uh, modifications, uh, you still have a very large positive oil shock, okay? Uh, furthermore, the Rio uh, has a significantly faster global growth for next year uh, than in 2014. And that growth is <coughs> more concentrated in the United States, okay? Uh, yet, your forecast is essentially for the same growth 
uh, as in 2014, the Samundi inquiry. So I'd like you to elaborate there whether you were missing. And connected to that, I have a broader policy question, global policy question for the IMF. If you are telling the oil exporters that this is a permanent shock and that therefore they have to scale back significantly, but then at the same time you are telling oil importers around the world to be very careful because uh, actually I've actually read stuff that says, well, it could be temporary, you don't know, use it to do fiscal consolidation. In okay, the end, maybe we should you let you a, answer. If you, if you have a message like that, everybody has to increase their savings, we end up essentially with a negative oil, oil shock for the world rather than a positive. I'd like you to comment on that. I think uh, we don't have that policy message. I think uh, we do think that oil exporters should consolidate with a, within a medium-term framework in which they anchor their consolidation on what's the medium-term expected price of oil. Those countries in which buffers have been built can be uh, more patient in implementing this adjustment and actually uh, fine-tuning their adjustment to the equilibrium that eventually will be evolving in the medium term to uh, in, in, in the market for oil. In the case of Latin America, I mean, I don't think that Venezuela has buffers, uh, neither access to financing. I think in the case of Ecuador and Bolivia, they have managed their macro policies relatively prudently in the last few years. But, I mean, if you look at, I mean, their fiscal deficits are large. So I think they should start to incorporate in the policy framework a low price of oil environment. And they should do that. And I think that for the case of Mexico, something similar. They have hedged their oil exposure for 2015. Uh, however, going forward, I think the negative shock to the price of oil will affect their budgets and eventually they will have to uh, tell us how they're going to adjust that with a medium term uh, framework and they they have said that they will do that in terms of the oil like, importers we have not said at least I, I did not say here that they should consolidate uh, I was just giving a little bit the facts that in those cases in which they have an administered price uh, this positive shock might end up being reflected in the balance sheet of the oil company, the energy company, or in the balance sheet of the government. That's a fact. And then you would say, and that, that I did not say in my presentation, uh, depending on their fiscal situation, what should they do with these resources in the cases in which this windfall, this positive windfall, is not being automatically transferred to the consumer. And I think that will depend on a country by country basis. I think there are countries, when you look to Central America, that were already facing significant fiscal pressures. On those cases, I do think this is the opportunity to consolidate their public finances. And they will lose a significant op opportunity to, to do that. So th there should be a significant share of these uh, savings that will, should be translated into strengthening of public finances. On other cases, this is, not, uh, this is not true. I do think that they should transfer this shock to the consumer, and the consumer should consume, as it happens in an economy in which, uh, I mean, they have a, a flexible market for energy. So, 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 so I think it depends on a country by country basis. In our region, it happens to be the case that Central America and the Caribbean are two sub-regions in which weak public balance sheets are really prevalent. And these countries have been slow in, cons in consolidating the public finances, so, so this might be an opportunity to do it, but it's not a general recommendation, and we do think that if you look at the Caribbean, high energy prices, for example, has been one of the main culprits of low growth. So this environment in which the U.S. is growing faster and the price of energy is coming down should also be, countries should take advantage of this to actually let these positive forces to spur growth and investment uh, in the region as well. In the back, please. 
<coughs> one of the good things about the growth model of uh, and the growth outcomes from Latin America in the 2000s was that it was uh, one of the pro-poor areas in the world. The uh, bottom 40% certainly had the strongest kind of shared prosperity prospects throughout all the uh, emerging market regions. The question here is that if we go back to rates of growth in the 1990s, and I'd just like to hear what the IMF's thinking is about the possible outcome for shared prosperity now with weaker growth prospects going forward in Latin America. I mean, I think it will be much tougher to continue to continue improving social conditions at the speed at which it was done in the last decade. I don't think it's impossible. I do think that when you look, I mean, there has been a lot of, uh, of significant improvements in the implementation of public policies in terms of uh, targeting these benefits, et cetera. But I, I also think that in an environment of abundant resources, uh, I mean, public expenditure or the focus on efficiency of public expenditure was not as important as, as it should have been. And I think there is a scope for significant reallocation of expenditures to, to have a much more progressive budget than what we have. I think that even within social programs, there is significant scope for a more intelligent targeting. So I think that if we focus even in a constant expenditure envelope, in significantly improving the efficiency of our policies, we can do much more. Uh, and I think that's where the focus should be in, in the future. And obviously, we highlight the energy subsidies because it's the most blatant, regressive subsidy that we, that we end up giving worldwide. I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating. There might be others. But this is, I mean, with respect to its size and with respect to how it's distributed, it's something that we could be doing much better. And there you have, I mean, on average, when you sum uh, fuel, uh, gasoline, and electricity, for example, in Latin America, you have scope to do a, I mean, basically to do a one percentage point of GDP between 0.5 and 1.5 in almost in many countries uh, and use them in a much more efficient way, even protecting the poorer segments of the population from the increase in electricity prices that might come in the in the future. No? So I think uh, it will be harder, but I think it's, uh, it's feasible. There's a question here in the front with the traveling mic. Thank you. I'm uh, Greg Treverton from the National Intelligence Council, which probably foreshadows my question. Your impressive analysis built in one uh, unsurprising shock, that is the end of Venezuelan subsidies. But I wonder, as you imagine other shocks out there that might change your forecast, either for the region or for countries within it, what's on your list? I mean, I would say the first, uh, I mean, I can just go and say normalization of US monetary policy. I mean, China slowing down, and therefore commodities uh, significantly affecting. And I think we, we all know of those. But I, I mean, I would really worry of a poor policy reaction function. No, I think uh, at the end of the day, we have seen a significant improvement in the implementation of policies in Latin America, both macro policies, financial policies, and uh, microeconomic policies. But in many instances, this has been done in a very benign environment. Uh, I think when, when budget constraints start being much tougher and being binding. Uh, that's when we have seen policymakers start being creative and start generating vulnerabilities. No? So uh, I mean, having Ted Truman here in the room and having him being involved in Mexico. I mean, Mexico 94 might have been, Mexico 92 would have been a much more manageable adjustment. Uh, but we decided that we wanted to defend uh, the parity, et cetera, by turning our debt from pesos to dollars, uh, by confronting, I mean, the slowdown in aggregate demand by expanding our development banks. And then when we had to adjust eventually, the adjustment of the exchange rate translated into an unmanageable issue because we have just 
dollarize our whole debt, and only in the span of two years. So in a sense, uh, it's very hard to spot important balance sheet vulnerabilities in Latin America today, but my fear from a domestic perspective will be that in, in the aim of trying to defend the situation that we don't build those vulnerabilities in the next few years. The question in the back. Hello again, Canuto, Burbank. Alejandro, fantastic presentation. Uh, in the second half of last year, there was so much talk about the uh, concerns with the known financial corporate leverage in emerging markets because of the Lima or EIS papers and so on. Is it fair to say that the take that you gave us was they had more upside with respect to uh, possible strong points on this, or is it unfair to say that your your presentation differ a bit from the bad news of, uh, of last year? I think we, 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 we last year we didn't think uh, that in Latin America we had any systemic problems in terms of corporate debt in foreign currency, uh, neither from a leverage, neither from a currency exposure point of view. I mean, obviously there could be specific problems, etc. cetera. Uh, I would say that now we have a much more guarded optimism because, I mean, to the extent that, uh, I mean, companies that are completely hedged because they are on the commodity space, there might be okay from the unhedged FX situation, but in an environment in which the price of their commodities is falling and the price of oil is falling, et cetera, maybe, I mean, leverage ratios are a, a little bit more in per than what we thought a, a year ago. And then if the deceleration continues, companies in the service sector and in the non-tradable sector will be confronting a, a, a harsher environment. I mean, having said that, I mean, this is just a situation in which I think regulators ha have to be super vigilant of these issues, but uh, we do think that this access to capital markets has generated a lot of advantages, and it might be the case in which these advantages uh, overweight the disadvantages at, at this point. But again, going forward, uh, it's important that if this access continues, it is not used to avoid adjustment at the corporate level as well. And we might end up seeing some of those uh, problems if uh, the risk appetite from investors continue and the slowdown in Latin America uh, happens as we expect that some firms end up, instead of restructuring uh, their operations, selling assets, et cetera, trying to continue re-leveraging themselves to maintain a situation that is no longer uh, possible, and that might generate more problems in the future. But in the current situation, I think I agree with what you said. That's right. I was struck by the figures on planned investments in agriculture, because price-wise, there's the group of uh, commodities that run, they rely on price not going so down. So any special reason for that? I mean, I. I think there was a, we haven't looked at this issue that in depth. I think our, uh, our current understanding is that the, the sheer shift from an ever growing price environment to a stability environment generates a significant revision of investment programs. And in that sense, that explains what we have seen. And a little bit our tone last year was that the region and even the corporates were going to suffer just because the environment was changing from one of ever increasing prices to stable prices. But on top of that, we got a significant decline. So I would say even for agriculture, I mean, this environment in which the near future is one of stable prices is very different from the environment in which they were having significant increases in their current income and therefore a much more buoyant situation to expand, to buy land, and to continue 
improving their technologies. Alejandro, I think uh, nobody can accuse you and your team of not being vigilant to the risks that might re emerge in the region, so that's, that's really excellent. Well, thank you very much for this uh, presentation and for being so engaging in the responses. Thanks, Mauro. All the best. Thank you.